Just because you got the garments on doesn't put you into ihram. You can have that on right now. It's having the cloth on and then making an intention and then saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik. That's when you get into ihram, the state of ihram, after which, you know, you're a guest of Allah and uh, you can't do X, Y, and Z, you know, you can't clip your nails or your hair or you shouldn't be arguing and, and so on and so forth. So after you do the two rakats of prayer, then you intend, oh Allah, I am doing this umrah or this hajj, make it easy for me. You're still not into ihram yet. Then you say, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka, labbaik in alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. Now you're in ihram. It's like I've said, Allahu Akbar, I'm in. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. MashaAllah, welcome to this uh, Hajj seminar. Uh, we have allocated about two hours for it. Um, just for your information, that usually every year the Hajj seminar we do is about six hours long, which goes into complete detail about everything, and then we answer all the questions. So this is the first time I'm trying to do it in two hours. So we ask Allah for success and ease, and uh, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it possible. The way we'll do it is that we'll discuss the overall hajj, we'll discuss how to do umrah, then discuss how to do hajj, and then after that we'll take questions, inshallah. I don't think I need to speak about the importance of hajj because clearly you're going for hajj anyway, having understood its importance or its obligation. So that's already a done deal. So I don't need to talk about its obligation. That's why today we're going to focus on the procedure. We may not be able to speak about uh, how to make a more wholesome hajj in terms of spirituality and more fulfilling and so on. There's a separate lecture we have for that. And we also have a detailed five or six hour coverage for those who want to do that online as well. So you can, inshallah, take that. So we're not saying that what you're doing here is everything because it's very difficult to fully prepare for everything. The reason is that in the past, when people used to travel for Hajj, it used to take them months. It used to take them months. Now you've booked and you're probably going to work until the last day unless you're going on Sunday and you finish on Friday. But if you're going on a Friday, you might literally be working till that afternoon, coming home uh, and then rushing to the airport. And then within about seven to 10 hours, you're going to be there. It's just too fast. It's just too fast in the sense that compared to how it used to be where it used to literally take days and days and days and the anticipation is growing, right? The spirituality is growing, the longing is increasing and then finally you make it there it's a totally different experience in my assumption so we have to try to do that for ourselves by uh, desiring and developing that longing from now as the days go by because it could possibly be the only journey that you make there for Hajj and it needs to be inshallah the best one as far as possible though inshallah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us many 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 more opportunities in the future the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Haji and the Umrah person is a delegation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when they ask Allah for something He answers and if they seek forgiveness Allah forgives them now in terms of uh, what you should take and so on I'll try to cover that later when we've got it on screen because it's better to show you some pictures what I'm going to do now is talk about the spiritual preparation of the journey, a bit about the spiritual preparation of the journey. Firstly, you want to go for Hajj, not to be called a Haji uh, by your friends, but maybe to be called a Haji by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I fulfilled my obligation. It is one of the five pillars of Islam, as you know. Uh, sincerity and correct intention enhances the Hajj. You'll still go for Hajj like everybody else. You'll still go on the buses and you'll still go in hotel and go and do the tawaf and was that if I, you'll finish it off and it can be a tick box exercise. However, the better the intention is and the longing is, the better the feeling and what you get out of it and how you benefit from it. Repentance uh, from all past sins is amazing because you don't want to go there and uh, 
um, you, you, don't, you don't want to go there and uh, be carrying sins with you because that's a, it's like you're carrying extra weight, spiritual weight. We're trying to take from there all the blessings and the rahmah. So if we can be forgiven before we go, then we go purified, then we enhance ourselves and come back like the day that our mothers gave us birth, inshallah, right? Resolving differences and seeking forgiveness from others, that is a thing. Because if we're going to get forgiven, we seek forgiveness for our own misdeeds against Allah, great. But what about those that I owe somebody money or I have sworn at somebody or insulted somebody or mistreated somebody? That's going to be a burden on me. Allah is not going to forgive that until the person forgives that. So that's why gone do, as they say, mafi talafi. You know, go and seek forgiveness from people and clear your debts with others. If you have any outstanding debts to pay, then make sure that you've cleared that or you have made arrangements. Or if it's a long-term debt, then um, if they don't expect it back sooner, then it's fine. Right? You don't want to be going for Hajj while you owe somebody money and they want your money and you're going for Hajj. Hajj might not even be obligatory on you in that case. Make sure that your Hajj expenses are from a halal source. Right? Uh, if somebody has doubtful wealth, the ulama suggests that take a loan from somebody who's got halal wealth, use that money for Hajj and pay him back. Uh, one, of the, uh, one very, very important thing is to choose the right company if you can. Nowadays, I don't know if you've still got that ability to go with uh, uh, the, the group that you want to go with because it's kind of become a bit more random since last year. So just pray that Allah give you a right group and companions because that would really enhance your hajj if you've got the right companions. And if you've got the right scholar and guide, that makes a massive difference. If you have the right scholar or guide, that makes a very big difference because you know, you're studying all of this now and you read stuff as well. But what's going to happen is when you get there, because you don't do it every day, you, uh, you're going you're gonna to phase out. It's like, okay, what do I do now? That's why take good notes. This isn't a bayan, right? So don't just sit here listening to things. Try to take notes and uh, get books on Hajj if you can. And what I would suggest that, yes, you're listening now just to set the whole scene for you. But what I found very, very useful is that every day, before next, the next day, every day, do a ta'aleem and a refresh with your group, your family, whoever you're going with for the next day's events. That way you're prepared a day in advance because right now it's uh, several weeks in advance. I forgot stuff. I taught a class before I went to Hajj first time. When we got there, it was like, okay, what do we do now? Because it's just a whole different scene that you haven't practiced before as such. So what I find to be very useful now is the day before, go through the stuff for the next day, the activities and the events for the next day, so that the next day is not a surprise anymore. Very, very useful like that. Uh, of course, I've mentioned all of these things. Learn as much as possible as you can about Hajj and Umrah, the significance, the virtues, the laws, the historical aspects. All of that really helps you connect. So it doesn't become just a little exercise, a little one day tour or something like that. Uh, you're going to need du'as there. So try to memorize as many du'as as possible or write them down and collect them or get a kitab, a book of du'as. Make lists of du'as that you want to make for yourself. You know, on your phone or wherever, make a list of du'as because when you're there, sometimes you may not remember at each of those places where du'as are, except you might not remember what to do. So I think it's very, very good. These are practical advice that I found useful that you can just pull out your phone and do all the du'as. You've seen the Kaaba for the first time. Yes, you can do du'as from your heart. Whatever comes out, then you may want to do du'as that you think are important for yourself. Get uh, People are going to give you shopping lists. Tell them, give me your shopping list for du'as of your loved ones. And you can, when you have time, you can make du'a for them. Those, their du'as you can make for them. Learn how to do salat on a flight. We've got a video about, about that on Zamzam Academy, praying while traveling or on a flight. Go and uh, look at that. And uh, you also better learn, if you don't know how to do it already, most people do, but if you don't, how to do Salatul Janazah. Why? You're going to do so many Salatul Janazahs as you've never done before in your life. Because nearly after every prayer, there's going to be a Salatul Janazah in Makkah, Bukharam, Madinah. If you've been for Umrah, you know. So you need to know the du'as for children if, the, if they've died or 
for the adults, right? So that's uh, really useful to know your Salatul Janaza properly. And of course, any other physical preparation, because there's going to be a lot of walking, a lot of sleep deprivation, uh, a lot of jostling and uh, clambering and sleeping outside and all sorts of stuff. So physically, it's a good idea if you start walking right now and uh, you need a lot of patience. Okay, let me just uh, g give you an idea. This is, a, again, a very cut-down version of what I suggest uh, because we don't have too much time. A travel belt is very useful during your ihram days because uh, ihrams don't have pockets. For women, it's okay. They can have pockets. They wear their normal clothes anyway, right? But for men, ihram garments. If you're going to Makkah first, then you want to take ihram garments from here. If you're going to Medina first, don't worry about it because you can buy it there if you want to and then go to Makkah. Right? You don't have to have an ihram. If you're going to Medina first, you're going to have to have an ihram from here. But if you're going to Makkah first, you're going to have to have an ihram most likely from here somewhere. Right? So you need to find some ihram garments. This drawstring bag is very, very useful to carry your shoes in the masjid. Because the, uh, you don't leave them in the shoe racks. Because they could, you might not find, you might go out for an, another entrance. So carry your slippers with you. Uh, kilt pins for if, so, if somebody's worried about the ihram slipping off then get kilt pins instead of uh, drawing pin uh, the, the normal normal pins this lana cane stuff is very very good for men right there's probably other stuff in the market now but this lana cane stuff it dries on you and, and as opposed to vasting this is for it's an anti-chafing gel because when, when, you're, when you're in a haram and it's hot there and your thighs rub with each other uh, 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 rub together um, it could get sore and then it gets uh, chaffed or chafed, whatever the word is. And then it's very, very painful for the next two or three days. Some people try to use Vaseline. Vaseline is sticky. This stuff is good. It has no smell. The anti-chafing gel. Okay, not shaving. Sh chafing, right? And it's really good. It works for the whole day. You just have to re refresh it uh, once a day and it works very well. Sandals, you don't want to get these little... Bichare sandals, the, the, you, you, you know, you get, while in a farm, you need sandals, right? You don't want to get the cheapest two pound uh, sandals from Primark. It, it, I, I would actually suggest you spend a good amount of money to get good slippers because you're going to need them and you're going to walk a lot in them, right? I've, I've spent a lot of money, invested a lot of money in, in, in some really good slippers, right? Because they're very important. Otherwise, you're, once your feet mess up, then it takes a while to recover. So you want very soft slippers with very good material. Okay, are these okay for ihram? In the Hanafi madhab, you can't have your top portion covered where you tie your shoelaces. That can't be covered. And your ankle and everything in line with that can't be covered. All right? So you can't have that covered. That's why the only slipper, this, uh, these sandals don't work. These sandals don't work because it's got these flaps at the top, right? They cover uh, above the ankle, so that doesn't work either. These don't work because they cover the shoe, the middle ones, because they cover the shoes, uh, shoe section. Uh, sorry, the the shoelace section, the metatarsal cuneiform bone section. These could work, but they're a bit more complicated. Therefore, they're really professional uh, who knows what he's doing. And then these, anything like this, these croc sandals. Uh, Olukai, uh, Reef, there's a lot of companies out there that make 30, 40 pound sandals, but if you're spending several, 8, 9, 10, 15,000 pound for a Hajj, I would spend, I would spend 30, 40 pound for a sandals, to be honest. And then you can use them forever, inshallah, for your Umrahs and things like that. Get some good sandals with a decent, uh, what do you call that? Insole, instep, right? So that you're, you're well, um, and that'll be a, a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, women, you can have any decent comfortable footwear that you want okay now what we're going to do is i'm going to explain to you the three types of hajj quickly for that what you need to know is currently uh, uh, as soon as ramadan finished shawwal right we're in shawwal about to go into the qada and then it's going to be the hijjah hajj starts around the 7th or 8th of the hijjah the third month after ramadan as soon as Ramadan finishes and Shawwal begins, the months of Hajj begin. Technically, we are in the months of Hajj. Right? Now, what's special about this time is that the Hajj will begin after the 7th of Dhil Hijjah. Two months and 
uh, seven days or eight days after Ramadan. So you have two months and seven days of Ashurul Hajj before Ramadan, before Hajj begins. Hajj is on a set date, right? Eighth of Dhil Hijjah, you go to Mina. Ninth of Dhil Hijjah in Arafah. That's what, that's set. Now, what determines what type of Hajj it is? There are three types of Hajj. What determines that is whether you're able to do a Umrah during this time before Hajj or not. Let's make it simple. If you go there and you don't do a Umrah beforehand, you go directly into Hajj. Then you've got the simplest Hajj, which is the last one called Ifrad, the single Hajj. You can then do Umrahs afterwards. That doesn't count afterwards. That doesn't count as one of these other categories there. Okay? So, sim uh, simple point is, if you're only going to do Hajj, then that's going to be the Ifrad Hajj. After that, you can do Umrahs after Hajj. This only matters if you're going to do Umrah beforehand, okay? Most people do do a Umrah beforehand because they go early, they do a Umrah, and then after that, they come out of Umrah, and then they do Hajj afterwards separately. If that's what you're doing, then there's two types, which is the first two types. You do a Umrah, the first one, you do a Umrah, you come out during these days, maybe five days before Hajj, ten days before Hajj or whatever, and then after that, you get into Hajj. Most people are going to be doing tamattu. Does anybody, do you guys know what you're doing already? Who's doing tamattu? Okay, who, who's doing kiran? Kiran is the toughest one, but the most superior one, which is that you go in, you do a umrah, and you stay in ihram. You don't come out. So you stay in ihram with all of its uh, restrictions, and then, you go into, and then you go for hajj. So you make intention for both from the beginning. Now, if you're going towards the end, it's okay. You don't have to be too long in ihram. But if you're going seven days in advance or more, you're going to have to stay in ihram. That's tough. But if that's what you want to do, I'm going to focus more on tamattu, okay? The only other difference, that the, the, see the difference between the first two and the last one, last one is only a hajj. Then you can do umrahs afterwards. They don't count as part of this. But if you're going to do a umrah beforehand, then either you're going to do it together or you're going to do it separately. Most people are going to do it separately. If you are going to do a umrah beforehand in Kiran or Tamattu, the only difference is that you have to pay, you have to do a sacrifice as well. You know that they call the Hajj Qurbani, the Hajj, hajj uh, Dam. Why do you have to do that? Because Allah gave you the opportunity to do a Umrah and a Hajj during the days of Hajj, uh, during the months of Hajj. That's why. That that's that's what makes it. Uh, that's why you have to pay a Qurbani as thanks. But if you're just gonna go and do a Ifrad Hajj, and then you do Umrahs after that while you stay there afterwards, no problem. That because you're out of the months of Hajj now. That's later on. You can do as many as you want. No 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 difference. The Kiran one is more complicated because if you do a violation, you have to pay two penalties because you've done a penalty against Umrah and Hajj because you're not out of Umrah yet, right? Anyway, we'll discuss that more in detail if you have any other questions later. Let's move on. As I said, we're going to be talking about Tamattu. What happens in Tamattu is that you're going to go in, in advance and you're going to go to Mecca Anytime you enter Makkah, you have to do a Umrah at least. You can't just enter Makkah like that. You have to put ihram on and do a Umrah. And then after that, you can do whatever else you want to do. So, a mutamatti enters ihram twice minimum. One for Umrah, comes out, then he's normal uh, without ihram. And then after that, he enters for Hajj. So, what you do is you go in. 10 days in advance, 7 days in advance, you go in ihram, you do umrah, which is just tawaf and sa'i, cut your hair, shave your hair, whatever, and then you're free to just carry on doing tawafs as normal, but you're not in ihram anymore, but you're in Makkah benefiting from there. Or then you go to Medina Muna, some people go Medina in between, and they come back. Now when you come back, or when is the days of Hajj, 8th of Zil Hijjah, usually they take you on the 7th sometimes as well, on the 8th of Zil Hijjah, you will now enter into Ihram again from Makkah. You don't have to go anywhere for this one. Once you've done Umrah, that Umrah Ihram has to be worn from outside. I'll explain that a bit later. 
But once you're in Mecca, to wear the ihram for Hajj, you don't have to go anywhere. You can wear it from your hotel. Because you're like a Makki now. You're like a Meccan person. You'll, uh, you'll wear ihram from there and then you'll start the five days of Hajj. I'll explain that later. But that, that's essentially what you do. That's at Tamattu. And then after that, you give a uh, sacrifice of thanks. Um, if you're doing ifrad, ifrad, which is the singular for hajj only, then I'm assuming that you're going to go very late. Otherwise, you're going to, if you go seven days in advance or ten days in advance, you're going to have to stay in hajj ihram all the way until you finish hajj. Most people aren't going to do that. So uh, even if you are doing this, there's no umrah. The only difference is that there's no umrah in the beginning. It's only one hajj and you don't have to pay a sacrifice of thanks. Right, now look at this. Don't worry about what are these side names. They're just area names which don't apply to us. Most of us are going to go by a flight and we're going to land in Jidda if you're going to Mecca. Otherwise, you're going to land in Medina. Manor, then this doesn't apply to you anyway. Uh, how many of you are going to Jidda? The rest of you are going to where? Oh, those of you in Medina, you're more relaxed because you're just going to go there without ihram and then you're going to come down from... Can you see the Dhul Hudayfa at the top? The green one at the top? al Medina. That essentially is going to be your miqat for when you come for Hajj or Umrah, whatever it is from Medina Manawara. That miqat is the first. Look at where Mecca is. Mecca is here. Jidda is very close, only an hour away to the left. And uh, the Zul Hulayfa is like four hours away. You have to be in Ihram from there if you're going to come from Medina Manawara. Basically, you know this uh, broken line? That is the miqat line. That's the outside miqat line. That if you're coming from outside of this area, you have to be in Ihram before you enter the area. So if you see the line here by Jidda, it's outside of Jidda, in the water. That's why you can't wear Ihram in Jidda, you have to wear it beforehand. And if your flight is going to the Emirates or that side first, and then you're coming from there, then uh, you have to wear the Ihram before you get to this Dhatu Irk. They'll usually announce that anyway. You just wear it from the airport. Uh, in Abu Dhabi or, uh, or Dubai or wherever uh, you, you, you're going. All right. Now, how do you wear ihram? Uh, if somebody's got an ihram, I can do a demonstration at the end. Otherwise, we've got two ihram demonstrations on our channel on YouTube. And uh, we'll send that to you. Or you can check it up on Zamzam Academy, inshallah. But essentially, there's a few things you do beforehand. You could be in Medina when you're doing this, or you could be at home if you're going to do it from here. Mustahab to clip your nails, remove your unwanted hair, armpits, and so on. Must, uh, trim the mustache. Um, it's uh, also recommended to have husband and wife intimacy, uh, because then you're going to be out of that while you're in ihram. Uh, take a, ba a bath, a shower, for at least perform wudu. Then what you do is, you put on your ihram garments, the two sheets for the men. For the women, they can have anything that the, anything modest and covering works for them. Okay. Then if you don't want to put ihram on now and you're going to put it on at an intermediate airport, like in Turkey or Jordan, for example, you've got a connection and you don't want to wear it from here, that's fine. It's still well before the miqat, right? So you can take in your hand. Don't forget it. If you're going to Makkah first and you forget your ihram, and you can't find one in the hotel in Egypt, uh, sorry, in the airport in Egypt, you're going to be in trouble, all right? So you want to make sure that you take your slippers, your special slippers, and your ihram and your belt and everything. If you're not doing it from home, and you're going to do it from the airport here or in the intermediate place. Before you enter ihram, you can apply perfume to your body. Because once you're in ihram, you can't have any perfume. You can enter into ihram with perfume on, but you can't apply it afterwards. All right? So it's a good idea to get some long-lasting, decent perfume for men because then you're not going to be able to apply it for a while, right? Perform two rakats of ihram prayer uh, when it's time for prayer. So you do two rakats of ihram prayer. If you're in a flight when you're doing this, you can sit down and perform them in your seat in any direction, right? Then you make your intention. Now, if you're going to enter into ihram, it's like, you know, when I say Allahu Akbar, that's when I enter into prayer, right? If I intend I'm going to do prayer, I'm going to do prayer, but I don't do anything, I'm not in prayer. It's only when I say, 
Allahu Akbar. Now I'm in prayer, I can't eat, drink, speak. Likewise, ihram is a state, the cloth is just a sign. Just because you got the garments on doesn't put you into ihram, you can have that on right now. It's having the cloth on and then making an intention and then saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik. That's when you get into ihram, the state of ihram, after which, you know, you're a guest of Allah and uh, you can't do X, Y, and Z, you know, you can't clip your nails or your hair or you shouldn't be arguing and, and so on and so forth. So after you do the two of prayer, then you intend, oh Allah, I am doing this Umrah or this Hajj, make it easy for me. You're still not into Ihram yet. Then you say, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka, labbaik inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. Now you're in Ihram. It's like I've said, Allahu Akbar, I'm in. Uh, the, for the men, they, can, they have to wear white usually. So don't go and try to find a red Ihram or something like that. Right, just to be different. It needs to be... Uh, oh. Uh, I've, I've explained uh, all the rest of it, right? And you, uh, as I said, you can perform, uh, you can put some uh, perfume on beforehand. Okay. Ihram for women, they can continue to wear their everyday stitch clothes. You can wear a niqab, but the niqab, but it doesn't, you can't have anything touching your face. You usually they have these caps, so the, 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 the cloth drapes further out. So their face is veiled. Uh, you can have a sun hat and drape the niqab over that if you want to. Clothing of any color, gloves, socks, and normal footwear are allowed. But don't wear flashy colors and stuff like that. Try to wear subdued, comfortable clothing, and it's going to be hot. It could be hot as well. Even if a woman is in her menstruation or post bleeding, no, it makes no difference. The only thing she can't do is pray the turakats. But she can still enter into ihram, say the bake, and all the rest of it. But she won't be able to do tawaf until she's out. Okay. Um, just in case somebody wants to ask that, that's, those are going to be days of menstruation, and I don't want to get stuck. Then they can consult a doctor and take some pills to delay the menstruation and to push it out. And when they do du'as like the talbiya, talbiya is the bake, they'll do it silently as opposed to loudly. You do turagats. You can have your hat on while you're doing turakats because you're not in ihram yet. Once you've done the turakats, now you're going to get into ihram, take your hat off because you can't cover your head uh, in ihram. Your hair has to be uncovered, so now take it off. Uh, make a dua and then say the talbiya. Talbiya means labbaik Allahumma labbaik. I'll explain what that means so that you understand afterwards. Women say uh, silently and as soon as you've done it, you're in ihram now. These are the intentions. You don't have to do them in Arabic, right? Essentially, all you're saying is, Oh Allah, I desire to perform Umrah. Make it easy for me and accept it from me. Now, you know, if you are going to do a tamattu, then what is the first ihram you're going to do? For Umrah. Now, you're so excited about Hajj, right? Don't go into an ihram of Hajj from there by mistake. Oh Allah, I'm doing this hajj for you. Then that means you've put yourself into hajj ihram. You're actually not in hajj yet. You want to do umrah first, then come out, right? Then do hajj. So don't make that mistake. Make sure you make umrah ihram only. This is the labbaik. And you know, you're going to have to memorize this, but make sure you know what it means so that when you utter it, you know what you're saying and there's some feeling in it. It means, here I am, oh Allah. Here I am. You have no partner. Here I am. All praise is for you. Every bounty is from you. All kingdom and dominion is yours and you have no partner. We are... We are responding to the call of Ibrahim salam when he built the house and Allah says, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا now go on, after they build the Kaaba, Ibrahim Aysan was told to go and announce that people should come. You've heard the call and you're going. So that's why he's saying, I'm here for you, Allah. Where it's a journey of love. It's a journey of presence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why he's saying the big over and over again. That is your main dua. 
until a certain point in the Hajj or Umrah. Okay. Now, you carry on doing this talbiya wherever you go. You'll hear people doing it. You do it over and over again. Just keep doing it until in Umrah, until you see the Kaaba for the first. So when you go to your hotel, you'll still be doing it. You come out of your hotel, then you first go in to do your Umrah and you see the Kaaba for the first time, then you stop. Then the other things take over. And if it's in Hajj, then you'll carry on doing it all the way until you pelt the big shaitan on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. So there's a difference of how long you do it for. You say it in the morning, evening, when you're going, when you're traveling, when you're going up in a lift and you're coming down and you're going outside, you just keep saying it basically. Okay, you know in a haram, the general prohibitions of a haram is good to quickly go through these, right? Men cannot wear sewn clothes in a haram once they put themselves in that until they've cut their hair. That means you can't wear a shirt, a turban, a hooded cloak, trousers, underwear. You can't wear underwear, you can't wear socks. And you can't wear full shoes. And even your sandals need to be those cut down ones, right? What is forbidden is stitched material. Now, if I took a jacket and I was feeling cold, a coat, and I was feeling cold and I just draped it over myself, that would be okay because I'm not wearing it as it's supposed to be worn. I mean, you don't want to do that, I'm just saying, right? Now, men cannot wear headgear. You can't wear gloves. Women can wear their normal clothes, even if they're stitched or whatever, no problem. They just can't have any cloth touch their face, except as mentioned above. Gloves are permitted if you really need really to wear them, but not advisable. Be careful of scented hot, scented hot towels in the flight. Sometimes they give their, they're scented, you can't have a scent. It's going to be so easy because we're so used to it. When you go to the toilet, that you just take the soap and use it. it because second nature for us to do that. That's where you, we make mistakes about that all the time. Just be careful about that because you shouldn't be doing that. Right, you're not allowed to apply perfume as well. You can change into a new set of ihram sheets if you want to, as long as they're not perfumed, right? If somebody wants like five days really hot, one usually works, some people change, but you're just going to carry extra luggage. And women, you can, you can move into a new set of clothing if you want to. Um, toothpaste can't be used unless it's uh, fragrance free all right uh, mouthwash etc you can't have scented food as either like very minty saffrony extra vanilla and rose essence you have to avoid that because that scents your mouth anything related to sexual intercourse and that's not allowed removing hair from any part of the body clipping nails is not allowed Killing lice is also not allowed. Of course, if it's a harmful animal, then you can kill that. Right? If you kill one or two lice, women, you know, if you kill one or two lice, it's sadaqah. Anything more than that, it's a dump. So if you like killing lice, be careful. Right? Okay, that's all the preparation in brief. Now, how do you do the umrah? So in practice, right, and practically speaking, what you're going to do is you're, you're going to go to the airport. You get there, you do your visa and all that. Nowadays, Alhamdulillah, is taking much, it, it takes not much time at all. It used to take hours before. Now, Alhamdulillah, it's very streamlined. Hopefully, it'll be like that this year as well. You'll be put onto whatever transport. I, I don't know what's going on nowadays, but you'll be put onto some transport. You'll get to Mecca. And hopefully, you'll get your hotel quickly. And even when you get your hotel, hopefully, you'll get your rooms quickly. And even when you get your rooms quickly, hopefully, you'll be in the, the right kind of people. Because there was quite a bit of chaos last time. So I'm just making dua for you. So say Ameen. And don't just look at my face as though, what are you talking about? Right? I'm making dua for you. Okay. Relax. You don't have to rush to do the Umrah. You might be tired. It might have taken you hours. You might have been held up somewhere. So go, put your stuff in. Relax. Take a shower without soap. It's sunnah to take a shower in Makkah. That means just like a wash. Right? Don't use the soap and shampoo. If you're tired, relax. If you want to eat, go and eat whatever you want to do, right? Then when you're ready, you need to go and do your Umrah. So I'm doing this as tamattu. So we're going to do Umrah first. So all Umrah is, is ihram, you, and you're already in ihram. Then you go and do seven tawafs. Then you do seven sa'i between Safa and Marwa. And then you cut your hair and you're out. That's it. It takes about two hours. That's all it does. 
Once your day takes about two hours. That's Umrah. Okay. When you're ready, go with your group, your family, wherever it is. Go to the uh, to the Haram, which is the Masjid, and you're gonna have your ihram on, and the women uh, are in their normal clothes, right? Nowadays, there's a specific door, usually the King Fahad door, and on to the right of King Abdul Aziz door under the uh, under that bridge is where they let usually, and unless they change it again, is where they usually let you go for tawaf down into the tawaf area. They don't let anybody go into that area unless you got an ihram on or women, right? So that's where you're gonna go. You're gonna say Umrah. So you're gonna go there, and. Uh, how many of you have done Umrah before or not done Umrah before? Okay, so the majority have, so you know what this is then, right? So I'm not going to take too much time on this because I've got a separate uh, coverage in detail, but I'll, I'll cover it with some detail. You enter the masjid with your right foot and you're reading Talbiyah, you're still doing Labbaik. And whichever door it is, I mean, uh, there, there are preferences, but now it's so busy that you can't always go from where you want to. They'll dash you from wherever they want to take you. Continue looking down until you're at a good, convenient place where you can see the Kaaba. Because when you see the Kaaba for the first time, all of your du'as are accepted, so you want to be in a convenient place where you can literally stop there and just cry your eyes out and make as many du'as to your heart's fulfilled. So that's what you'll do first. Just stop there, take your time, and uh, you know, make your, uh, your du'as. And then after that, you go into the mas'a, the pool, where you start doing your laps, where you start going around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as you know, there's, you have to start from where the black stone is. Now, if you're far away and there's a lot of people there, you're not going to know where that is so easily. There are certain signs and you'll get used to it eventually. There is sometimes a light or a mark on the masjid to the right hand side, but it's usually where everybody raises their hands. You'll just see that as a certain place where everybody is doing that. So you have to figure that out. The black stone is to the left of the door of the Kaaba. So your intention, uh, you have to have now intention for Umrah, sorry, for Tawaf. So you usually start from a bit in advance and you start moving anti-clockwise towards the black stone line. Remember, you have to have wudu for this. Tawaf is not accepted without purity. So if women are in menstruation, you can't do tawaf until you finish. Men have to have wudu. If you break wudu in between, you go do wudu and come back and carry on. But you can't do a tawaf without wudu. Right? It's like, like salat essentially. Now as soon as you've seen the black stone, you have to stop saying talbiyah. The tawaf now starts. So you make an intention. Without raising your hands first, you make an intention, you say, Oh Allah, I'm performing tawaf of Umrah to please you. Make it easy for me and accept it from me. Anything like that, any words to that effect you can do. All right? So now when you start going around, it'll be for tawaf. If you start just going around like that without intention, which, uh, why would you do that, right? Then that wouldn't be tawaf. So you have to make an intention. And I guess if you're going in there to go around, you're going to make intention anyway. You don't have to say it by your tongue, by the way. You can just think it. I'm doing tawaf. That's it. That's enough. Now, because this is a tawaf of Umrah, for men, they have to do this. They have to unravel their right shoulder. What they call that id tiba. Only men do this. All right? So that's the way you'll have your ihram on, and you have to do that until the end for all seven rounds. Women don't cover, uncover any part of their body. Another thing that men have to do for their tawaf, for this Umrah tawaf, and for their main Hajj Tawaf usually is Ramal. Ramal means like a marching. Uh, you know, we have to keep the right arm bare, right? But you also have to do Ramal. And Ramal basically means that you do this marching, which basically you just lift your knees more and you kind of take more heavier steps to show some strength. You'll do that only for uh, the first three circuits. It's like a brisk kind of marching walk. That's only if there's space to do that. If you're, if you're going to go there and the numbers are going to be huge and 
you can't, you don't want to be kicking people. So then you just do the best that you can. So you don't, don't walk too calmly in that sense. Then you have to walk like in a stronger gait. For the first three, then for the last four, it's as normal, okay? Women don't have to do that. Uh, as I mentioned to you, once you've gone around seven times, you do your final istilam, and then you kind of start going out in a tapered fashion towards the mas'a. It says to the mas'a, where the sa'i is, the entrance to that is. That's where the zamzam water is as well. So you kind of edge your way out, uh, and, and you get there. Now the purpose is, uh, now what you do is, it's sunnah to have zamzam water. And literally it says, stuff your flanks with zamzam water. Drink as much and you probably will be thirsty by now. So have a of zamzam, it's sunnah to have zamzam. And then after that you go to do the prayer. Now when you do zamzam, there's a special dua for zamzam, which you can memorize. Allahumma inya saluka ilman nafi'a wa rizqa wasi'a wa shifa'a min kulli da'a. Which basically means, I ask you for, oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge, ample sustenance, and a safeguard from every illness. May Allah accept that. Then after that, you have to do two rakats for tawaf. The preference is to do it by Maqam Ibrahim, but if it's too busy there, you can do it anywhere. So you'll see a lot of people where you go to drink Zamzam, there's going to be lots of people doing it there. You just do your two rakats for tawaf. This is as long as you're not in a makum time. So if it's after Fajr or Fajr time, or if it's after Asr, you just prayed Asr, then you can't do it, then you'll have to delay it till later. But you eventually have to do it. They're wajib to do these two rakats. Qul ya yu al-kafirun qul huwa Allahu ahad is the preferred reading in them. Likewise, it is the preferred reading for your ihram, tawaf, uh, ihram uh, two rakats as well. Okay? Then after that, you do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, accept this from me, this tawaf that I've just done and forgive my mistakes and shortcomings in it and allow me to do it many, many more times. That's the Maqam Ibrahim, but again, if you can't pray there, don't insist and block the path. Just go to the back because you can pray anywhere. Okay, now these are some Tawaf rulings that are very important to understand. Tawaf, every Tawaf has to be seven rounds. There's no Tawaf less than seven. Okay. The Kaaba should always be on your left, so you can't move around facing the Kaaba, like sideways. That won't be counted. You'd have to do that portion again. So it literally has to be to your left shoulder. You shouldn't even be looking at it. You shouldn't even be looking at the Kaaba as you go along. It's not here. Look forward, down. Right? You can. If you looked, it would be fine, but you shouldn't be. That's not what you're, looking, what you're doing. You're going around in humility, around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you get jostled and you take a few steps with your left shoulder not towards the Kaaba but your uh, body towards the Kaaba or behind then you have to do that part again. Don't get too paranoid about that like a bit of movement here and there and that's fine. But don't like you find a friend and then you start walking like that to the Kaaba you know behind the Kaaba because you're talking to your friend. Don't do that. Tawaf is valid only within the boundaries of the masjid so you can do it in any of the floors technically. It doesn't have to be at the bottom. You can't do it outside. Wudu is required. If you break it, go make it up again, come back. Intention for tawaf does not have to be made aloud. You can just do it in your mind. I'm doing tawaf. That's what you're going there for. What else are you going to go around for? Right? So you're obviously got intention anyway. Only the talbiyah should be allowed aloud. Uh, women, be careful where you do tawaf because it can get quite crazy, busy down there, and then you're going to get stuck in the middle and Allah protects. If Salat starts in between, that's fine. Just stop, pray there and carry on. It's not a big deal. You don't have to restart your Tawaf. Right? If you have completed less than four rounds and circuits and the above happened, then it's better to restart your Tawaf, but not necessary. It's better to restart. If it's less than four seconds, you've only done a minority then, haven't you? Out of seven, you've done a minority, then you might as well restart. But otherwise, you can't carry if you're in a hurry. Uh, 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 aside from the black stone, Yemeni corner, avoid touching any other parts. Be careful when you're in ihram of touching, if you do get close to touching the cloth or other parts, because there could be perfume on there that they put on there, and then you'll be in trouble. 
There's no particular dhikr for tawaf except the Yemeni corner to the black stone where you say, Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. That dua. So you can do any dua. What I do is I either have a, collect, uh, uh, a, a, a comprehensive book of duas, or I have my list of duas, or what I do sometimes is that for every tawaf, I dedicate a special dua that is important to me. Like if for my children is a very important dua for me, then for the whole round, I'll make dua only for my children. For the next one, I'll make dua, Oh Allah, I want to be accepted for the service of your thee. Oh Allah, make me a better person. Whatever's important, like figure out seven of your most important duas that you'd want and take the whole tawa, one whole tawaf and do that dua. You can do whatever dua you want. You don't have to read from anything. You can if you want to. Heartfelt du'as are the best. Or you can dedicate a very comprehensive du'a from the hadiths that we have. Right? A certain du'a that really inspires you, that you really, you know, is profound for you. Just do that du'a all the way around. You can read Quran. You can do Durud Sharif. You can, you can just contemplate. You can just be thinking of Allah. Do you understand? You can do what you want. Just because other people are there chanting loud du'as, don't feel bad because you're doing something else. You do what you think is most useful for you. Okay, now we're going to go to the sa'i. We've done our tawaf, alhamdulillah. We're going to go to do the sa'i. We've had a rest in between by drinking some zamzam, two rakats, dua. Now you're going to proceed to the mas'a, the sa'i, safa marwa. Usually the rule is, or the reality is, the higher you go, the higher floor you go, the less busy it is. So if you don't want to be part of a big crowd going back and forth for sa'i, go around, find the upper floors on the escalators or whatever, and go on. The higher you go, the less people, and uh, you could literally run a marathon then on the highest floor, right, if that's what you want to do. But what you do is when you get to Sa'i, the Mas'a area, where the Safa is, there's not much of a mountain left now, you can see some behind the glass. You still have to first turn toward the Kaaba and do a Istila. In that direction, this is your ninth Istila. You've done eight already for the Tawaf, ninth Istila. And then you read the Dua, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a'ilillah, and you make your intention. Intention is simple, I'm doing Sa'i, may Allah accept it and make it easy for me and there's other du'as you can read like la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulku wa alhamdu yuhyi wa yumitu wa hayyun la yamutu bi yadihi al-khayr wa ala kulli shay'in qadir that's a bit of a you don't you can see this on the ground floor and you can see it from above if you look through the circular hole right um before there used to be two mountains. Hajar, alayhi salam, she climbed top and she came down. And then what you're going to see are these green lights. There's still green lights there. For a short section of the hole, for like a quarter of it, there's green lights. That was the valley flow. So when Hajar, alayhi salam, climbed the mountain and she came down, this is the part she ran. And then the next mountain. That's my assumption. That's why we run there because that's where Hajar Islam ran. But women don't run today because she was alone. We, you know, women don't run down there. The men run and then the women just catch up and then they carry on. That's where you'll have to run. The rest of it you can walk. So, Safa Marwa, you start at Safa from that left-hand side and you go to Marwa, that's one shot. You come back, that's two. Three, four. Where will you end up at seven? At Safa or Marwa? Anybody going to end up at Sa Safa? Then that means you got it wrong. There was somebody who thought Safa to Marwa back is one. So they did 14. A waste of time. Right, it's a mistake. In fact, I had one person who just told me a few years ago that his friend said he's going to go for Tawaf in the morning. And he went. And he's waiting for him, waiting for him, waiting for him. At Asr time, then he's finally finishing. He said, what happened? I'm finishing my tawaf. He had done seven times seven. 49 rounds, he thought that was one tawaf. 
Okay, he got seven tawafs out of it, thinking it was only one, but you know what I mean? Don't mistake it. Overall, this is about two miles altogether. The whole seven rounds will be only about two miles. How long, how long does two miles take you to walk? First. About 40 minutes to an hour with all the crowd and everything. 40 minutes to an hour, that's what it takes unless you take, you take dua rests in between. On both sides, you get to Safa, you do dua. You get to Marwa, you do dua. Each time you do dua, right? And then after that, you, again, you can read anything you want. If the Salat comes in this time, you can just stop there and pray. You can stop for a uh, drink. You can stop for water. There's water stations, Zamzam water stations down there. And then you just carry on. Uh, for, for Safa, by the way, and Marwa, you don't need Wudu. So if you did break your Wudu, or women came into menstruation after her Tawaf, she could do Safa and Marwa. That's no problem. It's better to have Wudu, obviously, but you don't have to. Now your, your Umrah is done now. There's only one last thing you do is you go and cut your hair. Now don't be like such in a rush that some men and women, what they do is they take a pair of scissors there and when they get to Marwa, they start cutting their hair in front of everybody. That's just kind of silly. You don't do that. You go out and uh, the women can cut, take some scissors with you. You can cut your hair in your room. You can actually cut your own hair and you can cut somebody else. Once you've finished your Umrah at or Hajj rites, then you can actually cut your own hair if you want to. For the men, you go, uh, the, the, as soon as you come out, there'll be touts there saying, uh, Baba, 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 and they'll take you. So there's some under the, under the towers and there's lots of other places for that. Yeah, eventually somebody will give you a place. They charge 10, 20 rials, or the, in Hajj time they try to con you and charge 40, 50. So you shouldn't pay anything more than 10 or 20. 10 usually, but 20 definitely. Uh, and hash time, no more than that. Otherwise, you can cut your own hair or cut one another's hair if you want to in your own room. How much hair do you have to cut? So usually we cut all of it, right? The most reward is doing a shave of all the hair for men. Uh, if you are going to do multiple, cu uh, multiple tawafs, uh, sorry, multiple umrahs afterwards, um, for some people, they, uh, they don't want to cut it all. They want to cut it later. I just cut it all and then I cut it all again. What's wrong with that? I get a reward. Why not? However, for women and for men who don't want to cut all their hair, the minimum you have to cut is about an inch, right? Of at least 25% of your hair of your head. Now, why would you cut only an inch of 25%, then what about the other, there's going to be an inch left on 75% of your head, it'd be weird, right? So the only time that anybody would want to do that is if you're going to do like tons of the, uh, umrahs and you, you don't want very short hair for women, for example. So what you do is you get all of your hair together and then you cut an inch off. That's the best for women. However, if you're going to do multiple umrahs and you don't want very short hair, then you can do one inch from 25% of all of your hair of your head, then the next time another 25% and then just straighten it all out, if you want to. This is minimum, that's what you have to do. You will see that there's other madhabs and other people, you'll see they'll just be cutting like three strands and they're done. The Shafis do that, the Hanafis can't do that. Now that you're out of Ihram, go and take a shower and then you'll be in Mecca. You might go Medina, but you'll be in Mecca, right? And waiting for Hajj. In this time, you can go and do Nafil Tawafs. The same way, except that you don't have to wear Ihram. You don't have to bear your uh, arm for men. Uh, you don't have to do Ramal. You just do seven shots with the eight Istilams and two rakats of Namaz. That's it. And then that is the best action you can do in Makkah because you can't do that anywhere else. That's superior to every other. It does many tawafs as you can do upstairs, downstairs, wherever you get a chance. And then don't waste any time, you know, do, do whatever else that you want to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Alhamdulillah. This is just, I like to use maps to give you an idea what's going to, otherwise you're going to get there and be quite bewildered. So you're in Makkah. Where is Makkah here? 
completely on the left hand side down there as you can see well masjid al haram that's that bright area is the masjid the surrounding area is makkah to the right of it is mina here you can see mina and next to mina is azizia some people might be hosted in azizia their hotel might be in azizia you can see how distant that is from makkah then further down next to mina connected is muzdalifa in between there's a empty area and then Arafah is the furthest out. As you can see, Arafah is the furthest out. That's where the Mount of Mercy is. So you've got Masjid al-Haram, Mina, Muzdalifah, and then Arafah, which is further out. So you're going to go to Arafah. That's where the main event of the Hajj takes place. And then you come back. Okay. So just want to, so you know where you're going. And this is all north. So Arafah is to the southeast. Okay. Now, if you zoom into Mina, Makkah ends there at that line, and then all of this is Mina. All of this is Mina. And uh, the Jamarat area is that area right at the beginning by Makkah. And Masjid Khayf, which is the big masjid of Mina, is there. And the European camps are an hour's walk away. So, from this Masjid Khayf, it'll take about an hour to walk to these European camps. And as you can see, these are these, these are tunnels. They've got tunnels under these mountains so that you don't have to go all the way around. If you had to go around, it'd be longer. And you could get very easily lost. Very easy to get lost here. These camps have different countries in different places. So the European camps, they extend from this area into Muzdalifa. Right, these are Hajj days in a glance. The Hajj days are only these five days. They're the busiest of the days. So let's just look at it in brief so that you understand. Then we'll look at each day in detail, okay? The first day, 8th of Zil Hijjah. Sometimes they send you from the 7th just to get you there, right? Because it's going to be very busy on 8th. So usually most people go after on the 8th in the morning. But some, some, some groups or whatever, they send you on the seventh evening so that you stay one extra night there. So, if you are going according to the traditional way, the Prophet Wasallam way, you leave after Fajr, you leave Makkah for Mina on the eighth day of Zil Hijjah. You do Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha prayers there. It's a, like a, a landing spot before the main event the next day. Eighth is a very easy day. You're just in Mina relaxing, getting used to the environment. When you get there, you're going to find your space in your tent. And people have different reactions. People feel homesick. Uh, some people complain about too less space. But remember, they're trying to get millions of people into that small area. So you get like a space enough for a coffin, usually, right? So take it easy and uh, do the best that you can there. And it might be the first time in many, many years that you're sleeping very close to two other people that are not your spouse. Right? It's a bit of an experience, mashallah. So you stay there, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha, you do your salats down there and you do your other adhkar. You can get ready for the next day by doing your revision for what's going to happen, getting yourself prepared. Don't waste, Jazakallah, don't waste your time too much. And then what you do is you stay overnight in Mina because there's no other events on this day. So you'll spend that night. Does anybody know what day Arafah is going to be this year? Likelihood. Has anybody checked? If that's the case, then I can make it easier for you. I didn't check today. Okay, so if Wednesday is the, the day of Eid, that means it's the 10th of Dil Hijjah, let's say. That means the night is going to be a Tuesday. That means you're going to go to Mina on a Monday. Right? If our calculations are right, then that means you're going to go to Mina on a Monday. You're going to stay there for that whole Monday. All right? And sleep there the night on your whatever arrangements you've organized and they've organized for you. Now, the second day. That's the 9th of Dil Hijjah. So, uh, it might be that might be Tuesday. After Fajr, the coaches will come and start taking you, right, to Mina. Uh, sorry, to Arafah, the furthest place, past Muzdarifa. That's the furthest place you go out, right? You have to get there before Dhar. 
and you've got ample time, they'll start taking people off the Fajr. It takes a few hours to get the whole camp out. But when you get to Arafah, in advance, find a place. What you're going to do in Arafah is you're only staying there for a few hours. That's a, a, a whole town that comes up for a few hours and then it gets put down again. Literally, they only use it once a year like that. You're there from Dhar to Maghrib. You get there in advance. If you got there in advance, then have a nap. Don't waste your time. Because you want to spend from Dhar to Maghrib in Dua, preferably standing. So you don't want to get tired afterwards. So, and then the next night could be very, very tiring because you're going to sleep out in the open in Muzdarifa, which you may have never done in a long time or never in your life. And you may find not much space and you might get there late and then it's just going to get very busy. So you want to get a lot of rest here. What we usually do is when we get to Arafah early, we have a nice nap. Because it all starts after Dhuhr. There's nothing before. Th you can take a shower. I'll show you how the showers look so you're prepared. You can take a quick shower for, for Arafah just to cool, out, cool down. Anyway, so then you rest until Dhuhr. They'll have food and all the rest of it down there. And then as when it gets to Dhuhr time, that's when you start making your du'a. Uh, you, you, uh, you do du'a prayer. Some places they'll combine du'a and asr. We only believe you should do that in the masjid and not in your, uh, in your tent. So we usually do du'a first and then asr later. Okay. And then what you do is... Uh, uh, you, you start doing your du'a. Right? You start doing your du'a. Until Maghrib. I'll explain all of that in detail. After Maghrib, what, you can't leave before Maghrib. After Maghrib, you have to leave for Muzdarifa. That's the night you're going to spend in Muzdarifa. Day in Arafat, the 10th, the Tuesday, the Tuesday night for Wednesday, you're going to spend in Muzdarifa. You, you get, uh, so overnight, you get to Muzdarifa, you find a place to camp out. The later you go, the less space there's going to be. Try to make it as easy as possible. Women usually are in one area, men are in another area, just like slight distance away. If you can't, then just the husband and wife can be in one place separately somewhere, right? And then what you do is you, a lot of people pick their pebbles, 49 minimum pebbles down there. There's loads of pebbles, by the way, right? Uh, have a little bag with you, or you could use an empty small water bottle, whatever it is, and you pick your pebbles. And then after that, get a good sleep. When you get to Mina though, when you get to Muzdarifa, you'd have to pray your Maghrib and Isha. You're not, you don't pray Maghrib in Arafah, even though it's time. You pray it in Isha time. You actually miss your Maghrib time. You don't pray Maghrib in Maghrib time. This is the only time you do this. You do it in Isha time, in Arafah, when you get, in Muzdarifa when you get there. Right, remember that. And there you can do your own little jamaats, your own little groups. And then have a nap. Because the sooner that you wake up, the better the toilets uh, you can get into there. Otherwise, that is the worst time to get into toilets. Otherwise, you'd be there for hours waiting in lines. Right? Uh, it's gotten better because there's more toilets now than there used to be, but still, that is the most uh, challenging part, I think. What we usually suggest to people is keep water with you as well from before if you can, so that you don't have to wait in lines to do wudu at least, and you can pray your fajr if you don't have to use the bathroom as such. Then, it's Wednesday, the day of Eid for everybody else in the world. But for you, it's the busiest day and you're not going to do Eid. You don't do Eid prayer on that day. What you do is, you've stayed overnight in Muzdalifah. The standing in Muzdalifah starts after Fajr, in Fajr time. Right? It starts in Fajr time. So... As soon as Fajr time comes in, you pray Fajr and then you stand and do Wukuf, which means you do du'as, any leftover du'as that you have. And then after that, you proceed towards Makkah or back to Mina if you want to. The Prophet also went to Makkah. You can go back to Mina if you want to because it's a big rush to get to Makkah. So most people don't go to Makkah straight away. You go to Mina and you rest and go later because on this day, you're going to do, you're going to do pelting you're going to do your qurbani and you're going to do your hair cutting if your qurbani gets done and you could do your tawaf 
So there's at least three acts, if not four acts on that day. This is your busiest day and you've had a night outside. That's why I said get some sleep beforehand. Then after that, I'll explain all of this later. I just want to show you this. Once you've done all of that, you might have gone to Mecca, come back, and then you relax again in Mina. You're staying in Mina for two more days at least, or maybe three days. So the fourth day, which will be a Thursday maybe, the only job you have today is to go and pelt the shaitans, all of them today. Now, if you're in the European camps, it'll take you an hour to get there and back, uh, and, and another hour to get back. If you're close to the Jamara, then it's only 15 minutes. But you just pelt and then you come back and you just do all the prayers and you just relax down there. And then the 12th of the Hijjah, which is two days after, uh, after, your, after the Eid day, after Yawmun Nahar, they call it. Again, the only job today is to pelt. 49 pelting. And then after that, you don't have to do more any more pelting. There's an optional day or a 13th day if you want to stay on, but you don't have to do that. Most people leave on the 12th and they go back to Makkah and they've left Mina now. I'll explain all of this in a bit more detail, but does everybody understand the five days now? Right, it's very simple. First day you go to Mina and you relax for five, you know, five prayers and you stay overnight. The next day you go to Arafah, you relax and after Dhuhr to Maghrib you do Dua there. That's your highlight. Then you go to Muzdarifah, pray Maghrib and Isha and sleep the night. You do Wukuf at Fajr time in Muzdarifah. Then you proceed to Mina, Makkah, Tawaf, pelting, sacrifice, and hair cutting. And then you stay in Mina for two more days and then you're done. What you take to Mina, take a little backpack, sleeping bag and pillow if you, unless they're going to provide it there for you, whatever your arrangement is. Any snacks that you require, uh, unless they're going to, unless it's fully catered. Take a Quran, take your Hajj guide, take your dua books. Take a tasbih, take your medicines, your anti-chafing gel, your paracetamol, antihistamine, vitamin C, energy tablets, caffeine tablets, no Red Bull, okay? A change of clothes. You need to take a change of clothes because if your qurbani is going to get done while you're there, then you can take a shower there, cut your hair, the whole place becomes a barber shop. And then after that, you'll be out of ihram. So you're going to need to change out of your ihram. You're going to want to change out of ihram. So take a fresh set of clothing. And you can use soap and so on, so you can take toiletries. Although there are shops there they can buy this stuff from, but it's better just to take your own. And women, take your scissors because you can cut your own hair then. Allah, Allah, Allah. Most likely, you're going to be a musafir then. If you're staying in Mecca and all of that area for less than 15 days, you're going to be musafir. So you only have to break two, two rakats for the four rakat prayers. If you're going to stay there longer, then you'll have to pray full. Okay. And from the European camps, it's difficult to get to the masjid. It's an hour away. So we usually just pray in our own camps. That's what Mina looks like. You could easily get lost. That's what a tent looks like. You can see the beds are next to one another. Sometimes you have more posher beds, but pretty much it's kind of like that. That's, I wanted to give you a zoomed in view of the toilets because some people, they get, they get really freaked out. So I want to show you what it looks like. That's pretty much, I mean, there's one or two, like the high pan toilets. You go in there and there's a shower on the top. What you, what you usually do is go in there, raise up your ihram or whatever so that it doesn't fly all over the place. Take your top part off, throw it over the door. And then after that, there's a water spray. Just kind of clean it up a bit and do your stuff. And then, and then get out the, and then on the edge of each of them. They might have improved this, but this is how it usually is. Make a lot of du'as, etc. on that day, right? You can spend time doing Qur'an, Tasbih, Dhikr, Salawat, Du'as, Qadha prayers. Like I would really s encourage that anybody who's got makeup prayers from before, this is the absolute best time to spend your time. Just do lots of Qadha prayers. 
Yeah, I don't mind children. They bring barakah. It's just that when it disturbs others, it's an issue. Because then others, people can't listen. That's the only issue. But otherwise, I like children to be around. Okay. Don't complain about stuff. You're going to run into issues. Something might not happen on time. The food might come late. The food might be messed up. The coach might be late. Somebody else might jump on your seat. And so on and so forth. Lots of stuff can go wrong. If you have a five-star hotel or package, the five-star is until you stay in your room of your hotel. And as soon as you get out, you're with everybody else. All right? Just remember that. Uh, the purpose of this is to... It's a temporary place. It's not a permanent home. Okay? Okay. Watch the top part. We're now going to Arafat now. The second day. We're going to Arafat. After sunrise, you start going. I think I've, re I've, I've talked about all of this. Um, just remember one thing. Your camps are going to be numbered. So remember the number of your camp. Usually the European camps are from between... 28, 30 to like 50 or something like that. So your camp in Mina should represent the camp number in Arafat. All right? Uh, nowadays we've got phones and GPSs. It's made life easy. Otherwise you can get lost there and not know where to go. All right? Allah, make it easy. That's a basic setup in Arafat. They have much better setups as well. And for that several hours, they'll have fountains and all sorts in these five-star camps. They'll have all sorts of stuff. They'll make it look like out of the world for seven hours and then it all comes back down again. Right? But really, that's the basic camp that we've been in once. You see, this is your main day, right? So as I said, get there early, have breakfast or whatever, and have a nap so that you've you got your strength for after dhuhr. Because the best way to do dua is outside, outside, exposed, standing up. That's the wukuf means standing of Arafat. That's the way the Prophet Sallallahu did it. He did it by the mountain, on the sides of the mountain. You can go there if you want to, but it might be far from where you are. And you might not be able to make it back and you might get lost. So you can do wherever you are. If you can't stand up anymore, then you can sit down, of course. You're not forced to stand up. And if you can't stand up outside, come and stand inside. If it's too hot, stand up inside. If it's got AC, stand up inside. If you really get tired, go to sleep. Have a little nap. Don't waste time, that's all. Don't go on your phone, look at football scores. And start wasting time, YouTube videos or whatever. Why have you got five hours or six hours for dua? So this is the day when Allah says, look, I'm giving you an empty check. As big as you want. And you can write whatever you want. And I'm giving you five, six, seven hours that you ask, 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 and you get tired of asking, or you forget what to ask, or you're exhausted as to what to ask, and you can't think, then have a rest and go and ask again. The way I do things is that this is where your lists come in use. Okay? When I've done all my lists, and I've done all the du'as that I can do, I might join in a collective du'a from someone. Somebody else's du'a. When all of that finishes and I've got like an hour to two hours left, I'll take a collect a comprehensive dua book like an Hizbul Aadhan and we'll read the whole book. That book is amazing because it has all of the duas from the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ and Durush Sharif that you ever need to ask for anything you need in this world or the hereafter, it's all in there. And anything you need to seek refuge from in this world or the hereafter, it's in there. So. What I do is I leave the last two hours that I just read that. If it takes you three hours, leave it, you know. Do your own du'as first. When you get tired of your own du'as, you do that. Whatever you ask for, the shaitan can't come close. He's like afar, looking at the mercy coming down on this day. And he's like despondent. Don't waste this day. This is the highlight of your hajj. This is one hadith says, Al-Hajju Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. That's what one hadith says. Right? If you miss Arafah, your Hajj is, there is no Hajj. It's a pillar of the Hajj. It's not something you can do later. It's on that day, on that time, even for a few moments, you know, you have to be there. Sometimes if you're, somebody's very sick in hospital and they've come for Hajj, they'll fly them in at least for a few moments so they can say they've done the Arafah. So 
So that's when you do the standing in Arafah. You can take kitabs and different books and whatever else that you want to do. This is the special Arafat dua from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulku wa alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. So uh, if you are going to pray Asr afterwards, fine. Don't do comb- combination. You do Zohar, then you do Asr, and then you carry in your dua. And the dua is until Mother. Again, you can take breaks. No problem. Now when you get to Maghrib time, it's going to be Maghrib time, you can't pray. You have to go to Muzdarifah to pray in Isha time. That's the only time you miss a prayer basically and delay it later. Now, you've gotten to uh, Muzdarifah. Usually it only takes about 15 minutes to get to Muzdarifah, but this was the toughest journey over 10 years ago. It used to take 3, 4, 5 hours, even though it's only like a few miles down the road because everybody was trying to get there. People would actually get there at Fajr time and miss their Maghrib Isha. That's how bad it used to be. Now, Alhamdulillah, they've expanded it and it's become much easier. Uh, again, you could be going straight after Maghrib or you could be going two hours after Maghrib. It depends on when your, when your turn comes because they can't take everybody at once. Some people just decide to walk. It doesn't take that long. It takes about an hour to walk or hour and a half maybe. Now, when you get to Muzdalifa, right? You, it's, there's going to be these uh, highways and these roads that go through and then on the sides are these mountains and plain areas. That's Muzdalifa for you. I've shown you and I might show you some more pictures. You just find a place. Try to stay further away from the road so then you don't get any of the dust and the fumes and so on. And the sooner you get there, the better position you'll have. The later you get there, you're going to be trudging through people and trying to find a place to sleep and it's going to be tough. Right? But again, it's whatever it is. Find a place, lay down your bedding. Your group might provide it or it might tell you to take a sleeping bag. They might just provide a rug there, God knows, or sometimes it'll be nothing, right? And you just have to find a place or buy something. Uh, once Isha time comes in, then you uh, get people together and you do a jama'ah, congregation of Maghrib and then Isha. And then you do your sunnats if you want to after that, right? Uh, you do sunnats after that. And then you don't do sunnats in between. You do the two, raka, two Maghrib and Isha, uh, one after the other as a combining. And then you do the sunnats afterwards. And then you do your witr and so on. And then after that, there's no specific worship for this night you pick your pebbles pick at least 49 pebbles unless you're staying for that extra day then you need another 21 but otherwise 49 pick 50 51 just in case you drop one two here there wash them if they're dirty you don't have to wash them but you can uh, they only have to be small like chickpea size right and uh, yeah engage in some worship if possible and then get up, do tahajjud. This night is called the night of Arafah, but it comes after Arafah. Usually nights in Islam come before, but this one is night of Arafah, but it comes afterwards. You have to stay there until Fajr. Some groups, remember this one, some groups will try to get you out early. But remember the wukuf of Muzdalifa starts at Fajr time. So how can you leave before that? You've missed your wukuf. There is dispensation for uh, disabled sick people to go early there is dispensation for that and for some women there's and for women there's a there is a dispensation but the best thing is to be there okay as soon as fajr time comes in what some people do is they start they, they don't wait for coaches a lot of people just walk to mina or to mecca if you wait for the coaches it gets busy and it could get late so a lot of people actually walk. why usually walk what we do is we start walking beforehand, before Fajr time, to get to before the border and we stop. So we're still in Muzdalifah, but by the border. A lot of people do that. So you're still in Muzdalifah, Fajr comes in, we pray Fajr, and then after that we do our wukuf for about 5-10 minutes. And then you cross the border because now it's halal for you to cross the border into Mina. We go to our camp, put our stuff there, rest for a while, have breakfast then we go to Makkah on our terms when we want to. Because that time to go to Makkah is the busiest time. If you try to find taxis and that, they'll charge you, usually it costs 10 riyals. Today it'll cost you 200 and 300. This is when they make their money. And there's people willing to pay it. 
So instead of two pounds and three pounds, you'll be paying 50 pounds, literally, just to go. But I guess you pay 50 pounds to go to the airport here, so it's, it's like that. It's like London prices. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of his du'as that were not accepted in, in Arafah, they were accepted when he did them in Muzdalifa. So this is kind of like your, just in case you still got some more du'as left, do them in, uh, do them in Muzdalifa. Like do some du'as there. You've probably never slept like that on the dust. Uh, maybe not even in your life, unless you like camping. And suddenly you'll be under a multi-star hotel. Right, more than five stars. Multi-star hotel. It's really interesting. A wonderful experience. Okay, now as you notice, we're on the 10th day of Zilhijjah, the morning. Uh, you've gone from Muzdalifa. What do you have to do on this day? You have to do lots of stuff on this day. The rest of the world is doing Eid and uh, exchanging gifts. And mashallah, you are busy doing what? P-S-H. Keep that in mind. You're going to do pelting. That's your first job on this day to go and pelt the shaitan. The shaitan. To go and pelt the shaitan. Until you don't pelt the shaitan, you can't do your sacrifice. These things have to be in order. And until you're sacrificing, then you can't cut your hair. How do you coordinate all of that? Your sacrifice, most people nowadays don't do their own sacrifice. Otherwise, near the European camps, there's actually sort of houses where you can go yourself. But a lot of people uh, give somebody else the order. And there's all these banks and other facilities that you can give money and they give you a time frame when it's going to be done by. So uh, add a few hours onto their time frame at least, just in case they don't get it done in time because you don't want to risk that you've cut your hair before your sacrifice is being done. The best places to do sacrifice are the private ones that can call you. And again, I don't know what's going on nowadays, but we used to be in touch with them. They would get it done, usually by about one o'clock or something. And then we get a call that, okay, your group sacrifice has been done. We announce it. Everybody can go and cut their hair. Why is cutting the hair so important on this day? Because everybody wants to get out of Ihram. You've been in Ihram for like three days so far. And you want to be out of Ihram now because, you know, you're maybe all smelly and... Uh, uh, dusty and and so on. So, get your pelting done as soon as possible. I think if you get your pelting done by about, uh, we usually the latest we go is about nine o'clock. But usually it's about six, five, six o'clock in the morning is Fajr, right? So you can go straight then. A lot of people do that, but some people want to go re uh, uh, avoid the rush because that will be the most rushed time there. So what you do is go and relax and have breakfast and stuff in your Mina camp. Then walk from there about 9 o'clock, I would suggest. About 9 o'clock is a good time. And, uh, and then you come back and cut your hair. If you're, once you find out your sacrifice is done, and then the only thing you've got left to do now is the two days of pelting and the tawaf of ziyara, your main tawaf of hajj and your sa'i. You still got that left. So now, we're still on that day. As I said, you have to do three activities in order. Pelting, sacrifice, and haircut. P-S-H. Just remember that. On this day, you only have to pelt one shaitan. You know, there's three pillars. You only have to pelt, pelt the big one. And you won't get confused because the two will be empty on that day. So you won't pelt the wrong one. It'll be the one that everybody's pelting. So you only have to use seven stones on this day. You pelt that stone. Bismillah Allahu Akbar. That's what you do. You take the pelt. Bismillah Allahu Akbar and you pelt. Bismillah Allahu Akbar and you pelt. Now you can't miss it. It's a big wall. It used to be a pillar before. Now it's a massive wall. You can't miss it. Uh, don't throw slippers. Makes no difference. You'd rather say that shaitan is like so messed up that you only needed a pillar. Uh, sorry, uh, a pebble. You don't need a big slipper. People do kind of crazy things down there. Like, you shaitan, you've misled me all my life. I'm going to beat you up. This is the way you do it. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. The pelting time on this day starts after Fajr, sunrise time. The other days it starts later, that's why. Um, again, you don't have to do pelting until the evening. If it's so busy, some women and uh, slower, uh, you know, like 
with wheelchairs, they go in the evening after Asr, it's easier then. So you don't have to get it done earlier, it's just then your sacrifice will have to get done later. And then you just have to wait for your, uh, your hair to be cut, that's the only difference. Okay, these are kind of, this big building in between you can see, and these are on the right hand side are the floors. There's like four or five floors they've made. So you can go onto any one of those floors, but you'll be actually restricted to which floor you can go depending on the road you take. So different roads take you to different floors. And sometimes they close down the, the staircases and the lifts. So you can't just choose where to go, it'll be whatever it is. These are the various different roads that are leading into the, 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 the place of the shaitan. This is what it looks like now. Before it used to be a pillar for centuries and now it's become, mashallah, a big massive wall like that. Size of it will be from that door to here. That's how big the wall is. So before people used to get crushed here because so many people trying to do it, now it's become easier. On the left hand side is when it's very busy. Don't from far try to throw it because you might not get it. You can easily go in, find a comfortable spot and then do it. And uh, on the right hand side shows you a picture when it's not so busy. Right. I've already explained the Qurbani. Right. Your Qurbani has to be done now. You can go and do it yourself, give an order to somebody. It has to be done in the Haram area. There's some people they'll say, we'll get yours done. They do it in Sudan. That's not right. You can't do it in Pakistan. Right. Even it might be cheaper. Yeah, you have to do it there. Now you know your, uh, you know your normal. That's the, that qurbani is because you did tamattu. If you did a fraud, you don't have to do that. Now because you're a traveler, you don't have to do your every day, every year qurbani. You know your Eid Eid qurbani. Because you're a traveler, you don't have to do that. But you can still do it. So you can order two there. But what I usually do is my Eid qurbani. I order somewhere else in another country. That gets done on my behalf, my Eid Qurbani, even though I'm traveling, I don't have to do it. And my Hajj Qurbani has to be done here. Now, of course, if you get it done by somebody else, you're never going to see the meat. Usually. Uh, sometimes what happens is that they will have it cooked or somebody will have it and then bring it to Mina for everybody to eat sometimes you're, if you're lucky. But obviously the best thing is to do your own if you can. Uh, the Qurbani doesn't have to be done on this day. You can do it the day after and you can do it until the 12th. Until the Maghrib on the 12th. But the only delay then is that you can't cut your hair then. So you stay in Ihram. That's the only difference. So most people do get it done straight away. Alright, the haircut. I've already explained the haircut to you. It's the same as Umrah. You have to cut at least one fingertip amount, which is like an inch, from at least 25% of your hair. Right? Once you have done all the rights, you can cut somebody else. And they, so there's this fallacy going around that you have to be out of ihram to cut somebody else's hair. You don't have to be. As long as you've done all the rights, even if you're still in ihram, you can actually cut somebody's hair. Uh, now take a change of clothes and so on and, and change into that. All the restrictions of ihram now are over except sexual intercourse. You still, that's not allowed still. Allah wants you to do tawaf first before you're allowed to do that. He wants you to come and meet him first and do the tawaf first. The tawaf, the tawaf of hajj. Okay? Because remember, you've done everything now, right? You've done the PSH. You've done pelting. You've done sacrifice. You've done your haircut and your change. Now, what have you got left? The two more days of pelting, but you've also got tawaf, ziyarat and sa'i left, haven't you? Now, the tawaf is ziyarat. Go to Mecca and perform tawaf as ziyarat. You can go any time in the day. Some people prefer to go at night because it's less busy. So what we used to do is, uh, is sunnah for Hanafis to stay in Mina at night. So if you go in the daytime, you should come back by night. For other madhabs, it's wajib for them to be in Mina. They have to. What we used to do is we used to spend half the night, which means we've spent the night. We used to leave about 12.30 or 1 o'clock when we've done most of the night, so we spent our night in Mina. We used to find some coaches and go to Mecca and do Tawaf. It's quite a quiet time at that time to do in the middle of the night. But you do it whenever it's convenient for you. I've done it at different times of the day. And again, you can do this Tawaf until the 12th. Two more days you've got. Until Maghrib or 12, you can do it. Sooner the better, you get it done. You used to be late, say, at night? Uh, no. 
this tawaf, you'll probably be out of it. You can be in a haram if you haven't cut your hair and done your sacrifice, but you don't need a haram for this one. However, because it's got a sa'i afterwards, you still have to do raman, the marching in the first three. This ihram does not require ittiba. You don't even need ihram, right? So you don't un uncover yourself. You finish your tawaf, drink your zamzam, go and do sa'i just as you did in Umrah. It's the same thing. Now, you've already cut your hair, so there's no cutting hair after this one because you're already out. Like if you want, if your hotel is close by and you've been in Mina, you can go to your hotel and get some stuff if you want to. And then go back to Mina to spend the night there. Right? Because you have to st stay two more days in Mina. That night and the next night. You know, uh, practically speaking, going from Mina to Makkah for this tawaf and back, this, this is the time when to find a taxi at the right price is very difficult. If you're willing to pay 50, 100 pound, go ahead. Otherwise, what we do, we just walk. Uh, not all the time. That, uh, I'll explain when we, when we do the walking. And sometimes the transport can take hours because it's gridlocked. Everybody's trying to, not on this day, uh, it's on the 12th day. I'll explain that in a bit. Okay, you've come back to Mina now and it's the 11th day, the day after Eid. The day after your busy day now, these are relaxed days now. You'll see that Mina becomes like a marketplace now. So a lot of people are selling things. It's a very amazing atmosphere. People are just enjoying, you know, the Hajj has been, uh, you know, they just have to, only one job you have on this day, which is to go and pelt all three. So this is the first day you'll pelt all three of the shaitans. Okay. Usually, as I say, if you're in the European camps, it'll take an hour for you to get there. You pelt the small one first with seven pebbles, the same way as I explained, and then you go to the side and make dua. There's dua, sunnah to do dua, after the first and second one, not after the third one. So you do that, move on to the next one. They're all in a line. You can't go the wrong way. They usually take you in the one direction. You do the second pelting, and then you do dua. Third pelting, and then your pelting is done, so you come back to your tent. You go to sleep that night, and now it's your last day. This is only half a day. Your pelting on this day and on the 11th day starts at dawn time, by the way. So you can't pelt in the morning. But there are people who say it's okay to do it. They go and do it and they'll try to take you to do it as well. And we're very strict on that, that the time doesn't begin. You're going hajj once in your life. Do it properly. They say, oh, the coaches are going to go. You, we'll walk it, brother. You go with your coach. We'll walk it. On the last day, the 12th day is the busiest day anyway. But to avoid the busyness, they try to knock they try to take people out before Dhar and say, do the pelting quickly before time. They got a fatwa from somewhere and we'll just do it. We're very strict on this. So don't do it now. Wait. Of course, some people, uh, what we used to do is we used to take our, uh, we used to send most of our luggage with the coach and we used to just keep a little backpack so that we could walk it. If you've got your comfortable footwear and you're okay with walking, mashallah, it'll take one hour to the Jamarat and then from there, one hour to Mecca. And it's a beautiful walk. Everybody's walking it. That's our tradition. On this day, once I put my father in a car because he had to have a car just to go to Azizia. Oh no, to Kuday. That's where his hotel was. It took several hours because it's a gridlock and they charge you crazy amounts of money. That's why walking is the best on the 12th of Dhul Hijjah on your last day to go back to your hotel. If you're, if you're staying in Azizia, it'll be very close. It'll be like a half an hour, 45 minute walk anyway, as long as you don't take the wrong road. We took a wrong road and it took us one and a half hours in this really excruciating 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was crazy, right? So make sure you know where you're going. But if you're going to Mecca, there's one direct road. Everybody goes there after they pelt. You, you go in that direction, it takes about an hour. And mashallah, you get there and alhamdulillah, you feel good. So there's only one job to do this on the day, but it has to be done after dhar. Some people, they walk to the Jamarat and wait there in the morning, in the late morning, until it's Dhar time. As soon as Dhar time enters, they do the pelting, and then the time is right, then they, then they leave after that. And if you want, you know, you want to avoid the rush, relax. Go, stay in your camp, camp will still be there until Asr, then leave afterwards. Again, you do the same kind of pelting, 777, seven, seven, so 
uh, that's 21. Do dua first two. After the first two, you do dua. After the last one, you don't. And then that's it. That's your last day done. Now, there is an optional 13th day, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi I think, stayed for, and a lot of people do. Sometimes your camps will be dismantled on the 12th. All right? So if you do want to stay for the 13th, there's two ways to do that. You, you go towards the, uh, the Jamarat and you find a camp there to uh, basically stay in for that night that is still going to be open so that you don't have to go back to European camps because there's going to be nobody there, most likely. So you stay close by that night, the next day, you do that final stoning if you've got the time and then you go. The other option is that you can go to your hotel, especially if you're in Azizia, and just take a taxi back to the Jamarat the next day on the 30th day and pelt and just go back. So you can come back for it if you want to. But it's an optional day, but you get reward if you're doing it. Okay, what we're going to look at now, just to put things in perspective, this is a very important chart. Um, let me put this on there. This is a very important chart because what it tells you is what particular action and right is uh, obligatory, uh, fard or wajib or sunnah or mustahab so that if you miss any of this, you know what you have to do, right? Because we're getting to the end and you need to know this. Ihram for Umrah, that's a condition. Without that, you're not in Umrah, right? Tawaf of Umrah is a fard. So if you miss the tawaf of Umrah, your, tawaf is not fin your Umrah is not finished. The Ramal in the Tawaf is a Sunnah. So if you did miss the marching, your Tawaf uh, would still be done. Because it's only Sunnah. You'd be missing the reward, but it'd still be done. Okay? The Sa'i of Umrah is Wajib. Which means that if you missed it, you're, you'd have to pay a penalty if you couldn't repay it. If you couldn't go and do it again. But there's a way to compensate for it. You'd have to pay a big penalty. But otherwise, uh, you should go and do it. It's, a, it's a, still a wajib. It's a lesser than fard. Shaving or trimming the head is wajib. So if you finish your umrah or your hajj, and I've had questions like this, by the way, and didn't cut their hair, they forgot. Or they didn't think it was necessary. So now every issue you've had, like if you've used perfume or you've cut hair or anything afterwards, you're going to be paying dum dum dum, like you're going to be paying multiple. So make sure you cut your hair right, as soon as possible. New ihram for hajj on 8th of Dhil Hijjah. Obviously, that's a condition. And I told you, you're going to put a new ihram on for hajj on the 8th from Makkah itself if you're doing tamattu. Standing at Arafah is a fard. If you miss that, your hajj is uh, gone. Um, standing at Muzdalifah is a wajib. That's why for some sick people, they allow them to leave. And if you miss it, you'll have to pay a dumb unless you go back in that time and get it. If you miss it at Fajr time, you've missed it. You'd have to pay a dam. Pelting the big shaitan on the tenth is a wajib. You've got quite a few hours to do this. If you completely missed it, then you'd have to pay a penalty. Because the next day's pen, uh, pelting is for the next day. The sacrifice, the dam of shukr is also a wajib. Shaving or trimming the hair is wajib. Pelting, sacrifice and then shaving in that order is a separate wajib. So if you did all of those things in the wrong order, then those would be done, but your order would be wrong, so you'd have to pay a penalty for that. The tawaf of ziyara, that's the main tawaf of hajj, that is fart, pelting the three shaitans, all three of them, 11 and 12, the 11th, 12th day is wajib. How many shaitans do you pelt on the 10th day? Only one, right? But on the other two days or three days, you pelt all three, okay? Spending 8, 10, and 11th night in Mina is a Sunnah. The way do you spend the ninth night? In Masjid. MashaAllah, you guys have been listening. And there's one thing we haven't spoken about, which is the Tawaf al wida the farewell Tawaf. That Tawaf is any Tawaf you do after Tawaf al Ziyarah can stand in place for that. It's wajib. Except for women, on men uh, except for women who've started menstruating, they can, uh, they're absolved. If anybody else misses it, they have to pay a penalty. Basically, after you finish your hajj, there's one more tawaf that you do as a farewell one before you leave. It should be the preferably the last one you do. But if you've done any tawaf, 
after your Hajj Tawaf, he'll stand in place of it. But you do him specially for that. Okay, let's just quickly go through differences in a woman's Hajj. She does not raise her voice when doing du'as and talbiya. She does not do ramal, nor rush between the green lines when performing sa'i. She doesn't bare her shoulder. She does not shave her head, rather trims her hair. Uh, you know, if a man has zero already and he's just done another umrah, then he still has to pass a blade over his head for whatever comes off. If a woman has had, for example, lost her hair because of chemotherapy, has got very small hair, and by cutting an inch is going to be, then she can just pretend to cut because hair is not some, uh, having no hair for women is not a good thing, right? She may wear normal stitched garments of any decent color and not just white. Uh, a lot of women think that they have to wait or wear only white in ihram. That's not true. She should not go between a crowd of men when, when trying to greet the black stone at any point during pilgrimage because it just gets very uncomfortable and can get, you know, uh, can get worse than that. Now, what I'm going to mention is the most tricky section for a woman is that because of menstruation, there's one thing that she can't do in Hajj. What is that? The Tawaf. Everything else she can do, Arafah, Muzdalifa, stoning, everything is fine. Just Tawaf. And without the Tawaf, your Hajj is incomplete. That's the Tawaf is the Arab. So now, there's some women who, they're going to come on soon, any time now. What they should do is the tawaf time begins after the wukuf of Muzdalifah, that morning of the 10th. Straight from Muzdalifah, straight from Muzdalifah after Fajr, they should go straight to Mecca. Forget the pelting. The husband should go with them and go and do your tawaf. Get it out of the way then come back and do the pelting and sacrifice and all of that. Because if you've got that out of the way, you're done. If you don't and your menstruation kicks in, you'll have to stay. Because you can't go in the masjid with menstruation on. Then you have to stay in the masjid. Then you have to stay for another seven, eight days until you finish to do the tawaf or come back for it. Go to Madin and come back for it. But you'll be, uh, you know, you'll still not be fully out. You'll be out of ihram, but you can't be fully... No, you can't... Uh, yes, uh, because... You're out of ihram by cutting your hair and so on. So you can do that anyway. But until you don't do tawaf ziyara, you're not fully out of ihram, which means sexual intimacy is still not allowed. It's just quickly before I take your questions. There are four types of penalties for doing wrong things in hajj or umrah. Uh, sacrifice of a large animal, that's a big one. Cow or camel, you'll be set back a that more than a thousand pounds for that one. Usually people don't make that kind of, we say this is only two things that can make this penalty. Sac uh, sacrifice of a small animal like a sheep or goat, which usually costs 100 to 150 pounds. Uh, minor infraction, sadaqatul fitr, or less than sadaqatul fitr. Right, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I'll give you a bit of an idea, right? The thing the penalty for the large animal can only happen in two cases. Sexual intimacy after Arafah, but before cutting the hair. So, after the day of Arafah, a person had sexual intimacy before they cut the hair. I don't know why anybody would do that. They'd be so rushed to do it, I don't understand. But if they did, then they'd do a camel. Number two, if a man in a state of major ritual impurity, seminally defiled state, no whistle. He goes in the tawaf, or a woman in menstruation goes in the tawaf, they'd have to pay a big animal. That's the problem. It's haram to go, and you get a big animal to pay as well. The smaller animal, I mean, you can't remember all this, but at least keep it in mind. Any form of sexual intimacy will necessitate a small animal. A man wearing normal clothing for a whole day or whole night or half a day and half a night will necessitate it. Um, what else? 
shaving a quarter or more of the hair of the head or beard before it's time, you know, during ihram. Covering the face for a whole day. If you cover it for a few hours, then it's a sadaqah. Clipping all the nails of one hand or one foot. If you cut just one nail of that sadaqah. If you cut all five of one hand, that's a dumb, that's an animal, small animal. Applying perfume to one whole body part of clothing. Omitting tawaf al wida, omitting any wajib of the Hajj and not then going and doing it, you'd have to pay a dam instead. If anything omitted is redone, then the penalty goes, is dropped. Uh, Sadaqah penalties, smaller penalties, shaving or trimming less than a quarter of the hair of the head, or pulling your beard or hair and uh, five, six strands come off. If one or two strands come off, then it's the smaller sadaqah. Like a, a pound or two. Clipping one or two nails. Like for example, say a nail is really bothering you and you clip that, you'd have to pay sadaqah. It might be valid to do it because it's bothering you, but you still have to pay sadaqah. In Hajj, any of these infractions, even if you do it for a valid excuse, except for a menstruating woman, tawafal with that, you still have to pay the penalty. You might not be sinful though. If a man wears normal clothing or covers his head for a few hours, that will be a sadaqa as well. Uh, the tawaf al wada, if you perform that without wudu, because it's a lesser tawaf, not the tawaf of umrah or tawaf of hajj, the main one, you, uh, you pay sadaqa instead of a dab. Otherwise, in those, you pay a dab unless you go and repeat it. If you leave out one stone for you only did six stones or five stones, then you pay sadaqa for the stone that you missed, unless you got time to go back and do it. And the smaller one, if you kill one lie, so you pluck one or two strands of the hair. Or, you know, when you're doing wudu and you, you went like this and one or two strands came out, you pay a minor sadaqa. So it's always a good idea to give a bit of sadaqa. Some people think it's better to also give one animal. I mean, you don't have to if you've not done anything for sure. Just ask. Okay, the tawaf al wada, as I mentioned already, is the last rite. And there are some fatwas that go around that you can't do any shopping after tawaf al wada. That's not entirely true, but the truth in it is that the tawaf with that literally should be the last, pr last thing that you do before you leave. But that's not always possible because of timing wise and the busyness. So if you did have to go and buy something, you could, you won't spoil your tawaf with that. Let's put it that way. Right. There's this fallacy that you can't look in the mirror when you're in a haram. That's wrong as well. You can. But the main thing about Hajj, you have to remember, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Hajju, Al Ajju, Wa Thajju. The Hajj is to be in a disheveled, unkept state that you're not talking about your grooming because you're there. What's the whole purpose of Hajj? I've got these two simple garments on and I'm going from one place to the next like a spiritual washing machine, being purified by Allah. And I'm not worried about that's why to be constantly removing dirt is actually against the spirit of Hajj. Yes, if it's filth, that is going to be najasa, then you need to get rid of that. You can use unscented soap for when you come out of the toilet. You can't use scented soap, right? You need to avoid all of that. However, to go in a sh uh, people take unscented soap for showers. You don't want to do that because you're going against the state of the unkept disheveled state. You don't want to be co combing your hair during that time. It's fine to be the way you are until you get out. Then you want to comb everything. Because you shouldn't be focused, you should be focused on Allah. You know when you have something really critical in your life that's going, are you worried about everything else in that time? No, you're just like, just about keeping yourself groomed, right? That's the purpose of it. Um, visit to Medina Munawwara is a whole separate lecture, uh, which uh, our time is up. We're going to take questions first and uh, about Hajj, inshallah. So if you, whether you're in Azizia or uh, your hotel is in Azizia or Mecca, in the daytime you could go to your hotel and then come back. It's sunnah to spend the night in Mina though. However, if Mina is for some people who are sick or whatever, then in the Hanafi Madhab you could even spend it in your hotel if you can't spend it in Mina for whatever reason. Right? But the Prophet ﷺ didn't go. He only went for tawaf and he came back. So the preference is to stay there. But if you need to go for something, pick up something, then it's fine. 
Can men and women wear sunglasses? Yes, you can. They have to be Ray-Ban. No, they can be anything. Because wearing sunglasses is not covering your face because they're resting on your nose. They're not covering your face. That is not covering your face. You can wear sunglasses. Yes, uncle. Yeah. If you're a musafir, you can't pray for namaz. You have to, you have to take the discretion. Do qada prayers. Use that time to do qada prayers or extra nafil or sunnah prayers if you want to. Yeah. Whenever you enter any masjid, you recite Allahumma ftahli abab rahmatik. It's not part of the hajj scene. It's a separate sunnah dua for any masjid you enter into. You don't have to do it. And if you forgot it, it wouldn't spoil your hajj. But it's just something you want to do. And you also, it's a good idea whenever you enter any masjid, especially Medina Munawwara in Masjid Nabawi, make an intention for etikaf as well. So let's just say that you did tawaf and it's makru time after asr. So you can't do tawaf, uh, the two rakats for tawaf. That's fine. You can actually go and do another tawaf if you want to do, or you can do sa'i. Then do the, yeah, then do the, the uh, two rakats afterwards, after the sa'i. Or in between the sa'i if you want to as well. Yeah, yeah. In sa'i, you could, in fact, you don't even have to do sa'i after tawaf. You could delay it. You could do tawaf and if you're very tired, I'm not saying you should do this, you can go and rest and come back to do sa'i. It's not necessary to do afterwards, meaning straight afterwards. I'm just saying that just in case. Best to do it after. Yes, well. In, in Saudi, as in, other, as in other countries, they pray Asr in the earlier time, before the Hanafi time begins. But because that opinion exists in the Hanafi school as well, uh, you can take that when you're in such circumstances. As long as you pray your Dhar in advance then. Who is a Musafir? A Musafir is basically anybody who's not going to be spending... 15 days or more in Makkah, for example. If you don't spend more than 15 days or more in any one place, then you're a musafir. Then you do qasr. Unless you're praying in, with imam or jamaat, then you do whatever the imam does. So you can't stop after two rakats in dhuhr from the imam and say, Me musafir, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it looks like we're done. MashaAllah, I can't believe that we've done it in 2 hours and 13 minutes. I can't believe it. You, that's because I cut it down quite a bit. If you want a bigger suggest, you know, then check the Zamzam, go to Zamzam Academy channel or website. It's got the full Hajj seminar there in four or five sections. Listen to that in more detail. It's got a lot more practical suggestions. I've not been able to give you a lot of hacks and things like that. Also, the reason I did this seminar was very selfish. I'll tell you that. Okay, so don't run away yet. I did this seminar and came all the way down one hour drive, right? For a very selfish reason. And that is to get your du'as. Because I've noticed that I do seminars every year and I usually take a hajj group or with a hajj group, I get a lot of benefit because I get everybody's reward. So this time I'm going to request special du'as from you. That Remember this, uh, this, uh, this guy who... Um, you know, explained all of this to you if you can. Inshallah, write my name in your list of du'as that Allah Ta'ala accept us for the service of His deen, remove the obstacles and uh, problems in our life and make us successful and on the deed. Okay? So that's just a little selfish request for du'a. Right? I mean, I mean. And I have a public number on Zamzam Academy. Contact us page. If you do run into any troubles, you can give me a call. All right? Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially for example the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of 
uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.